All right, so let's talk about whether these firms in an oligopoly market are more likely to cooperate with one another or compete with one another. Well, here's the idea. Um, when, let's say that there are a group of firms, let's say all the airlines, let's say that they're really competing with each other. Well, one of the one of the ways that firms compete with one another is by cutting prices, right? Oh, well, we want more customers. So we're going to charge a lower price. That way, more of your customers will come over to us. Well, all they're going to do over there is cut their prices lower, and then a bunch of the customers go from you over to them. And if there's a price war that starts among all of these airlines, then the only people that are going to benefit are the customers. That's awesome, and the government likes that, society likes that, they want the customers to benefit. We want as much utility as possible. So what there's going to be is when there's co competition, there's going to be more utility for consumers. Okay? Let's say the, the biggest brother or the biggest sister gets the others together and says, hey, look, look, all we're going to do is we're just hurting ourselves here. By cutting our prices lower and lower and lower and trying to, trying to get it, uh, customers from each other, all that's doing is hurting, hurting us, okay? Why don't we get together? Why don't we cooperate and agree not to lower our prices? In fact, we could agree to raise our prices. If we all agree to raise our prices, then those customers out there are all going to have to pay a higher price because they can't leave my business to your business to get a lower price. We're all charging a higher price and then we all benefit and they don't benefit as much. And that would be co cooperation. Okay. Now, when the oligopoly firms in an industry, when they cooperate with each other, we have a special name for that. It is called collusion. Okay, so when they collude to get together and agree upon two things, they will get together and agree upon the quantity to be produced and the price to be charged. Okay, and so they're going to collude on quantity and on price. Okay. Now, when they collude and decide on quantity and price together as, as one group, what they're basically doing is they're behaving like one company. They're behaving like a monopoly. And so one way to look at oligopolies is you can treat them as a monopoly, as if they face one market structure graph and they are all sort of uh, melded together as one producer as a monopoly. So when oligopoly firms decide that they're going to cooperate, they're going to behave a lot more like a monopoly than they will as competitors. Now, there's two kinds of cooperation. There is overt cooperation or collusion. There's overt collusion and there is tacit collusion. And basically what these two things mean is overt collusion is official on the books written down, everybody has a written agreement that we're going to agree together. Well, that's actually illegal. In the United States, it is not legal for firms that are in competition with each other to agree with each other on how much money that they're going to charge. In fact, interesting story, uh, my father-in-law was a dentist and he told me a story one time that if he went and had lunch with another dentist, because he was friends with several dentists, if he went and had lunch with a dentist, he was by law not allowed to talk about prices with, his, uh, with other dentists. If he said, hey, how much do you charge for a root canal? Automatically, he can get in trouble and he can be fined and possibly shut down by the government for overt collusion by just discussing how much money that they charge for different operations or different services can get them in trouble for collusion. So he said he was not allowed to talk about ever how much other dentists charged and how much he charged if he was talking with another dentist. But tacit collusion is an interesting thing. Tacit collusion is unofficial cooperation. This is where the companies, instead of actually talking about agreeing, they signal each other. And a great example of tacit collusion is 
uh, uh, gas stations, okay? So you see a gas station, right? Let's say that you got one gas station on one side of the road, they're charging $2.40 for a gallon of gas. On the other side, they're charging $2.42 for a gallon of gas. That's not much of a difference. Maybe the guy who's charging $2.42, he's in a better position physically on the road, okay? Say it's easier to get in and out of his gas station and it's not as easy to get in and out of this one over here. So this guy's two cents cheaper, right? Um, well, let's say that this guy over here wants to, uh, you know, uh, raise his price. You know, what they'll do is l the two of them, they both want to raise their price, but they don't want the other, you know, they don't want to lose business. So one of them will raise their price, let's say by a penny or two, and the other gas station will raise their price by two or three cents. And that'll show that the two of them are sort of agreeing, but they haven't talked about it. They haven't written anything down. It is not overt collusion. It is tacit collusion. And this is something that we believe happens among oligopoly firms, that they signal each other. They signal how much one another should be producing in quantity and how much they should be charging in price so that they can cooperate with each other instead of competing with one another, okay? Um, and so whether they are colluding overtly or tacitly, if they are colluding, then like I said, they are behaving like one company and they're behaving, uh, they're, they're, uh, they'll have a market structure that's much closer to a monopoly than closer to competition. Now, in the United States, we have what are called antitrust laws. An antitrust law is a law that promotes competition. In the United States, we like for businesses to compete with each other and undercut each other because it's good for customers. It's good for the community. At least that's the way we see it. We want companies charging lower than their competitor so that people can get lower prices and get more utility out of the money that they're spending, okay? And so in the United States, if there are two companies that decide to start agreeing on raising the price together, they can get in big trouble with the government because of antitrust laws. And the Justice Department in the United States, they don't need a customer to file a lawsuit against them. The Justice Department, the federal government, can actually go in and file a, a criminal charge against these companies for violating antitrust laws. Now, another thing that these antitrust laws do is they inhibit mergers. Now, what is a merger? Well, if you don't already know what a merger is, a merger is where two companies that are separate come together and become one company together. It's like a marriage between two companies. Now, I don't want to get too deep into what that marriage means. Oftentimes, it's one bigger company taking over a smaller company. I'm not getting into that right now. You can get into that yourself. But like J.P. Morgan Chase, J.P. Morgan and Chase got together. They were two completely separate companies and they put their companies together and they only kept one leader and one group of leaders at the top, but most of the other people at the bottom, probably I say bottom, meaning the, the line workers, most of them probably got to keep their jobs. More, very recently, there was a merger between uh, SunTrust Bank and BB&T Bank, which are both regional banks, and they have now become the eighth largest bank in the United States by merging and becoming Truist Bank, okay? Uh, and so a merger is the ultimate in cooperation. It's where two companies that want to cooperate so much that they're just going to come together and become one company. And so this is one of the ways that Disney has become such a large filmmaker is Disney has merged with other smaller filmmakers to become uh, a larger and larger filmmaker, okay? And now here's what happens with antitrust laws. Sometimes the federal government will get involved and tell two companies, no, you cannot merge. Imagine if Target and Walmart decided that they were going to merge with each other and become one gigantic. Now, that's not really that much of a merger. Walmart is like four or five times the size of Target. But nonetheless, Target is, you know, people love shopping at Target. Uh, but if Walmart and Target said, hey, let's become, uh, you know, Waltar um, uh, or, or Walgit or something like that, I don't know, if they wanted to become one company, the federal government might say, look, people, you know, 
they they comparison shop between Target and Walmart. You know, if they if if the Target and the Walmart in the same town became the same company, then there wouldn't really be competition. We don't like that. And so sometimes the federal government will intervene and say, no, you may not merge. You will become too large in the industry and the antitrust laws are going to inhibit you or the antitrust sentiment is going to prohibit those two companies from merging with one another. Okay, so that's on the cooperation side. Over on the competition side, in an oligopoly market, when, when the firms, the four or five, maybe 10 or 12 firms are all competing with each other, when they behave more competitively with each other, they act more like monopolistic competition. Okay, And so what we're going to see here is that oligopoly really doesn't have anything new for us. Now, that's not entirely true. If you want to get into the intermediate level and the advanced level of oligopoly, we're not going there in this class. There's all kinds of theories of oligopoly behavior, like kinked demand curve theory and cartel theory. That's all, to me, intermediate level stuff. You should dive right in and learn that stuff. But basically speaking, oligopolies are either going to behave like a monopoly or they're going to behave like monopolistic competition. And what that means is, when they behave like a monopoly, they're going to have a steeper demand curve. So we're going to write that in here. When they behave like a monopoly, they have a steeper demand curve, right? Because monopolies have a steeper demand curve. When an oligopoly behaves more like monopolistic competition, they usually have a flatter demand curve. But because they're price setters, because oligopoly is a price setter, they always have a downward sloping demand curve and a separate marginal revenue curve. Okay. Now, even though they're behaving like monopolistic competition, remember in actual monopolistic competition, there are low barriers to entry. So a lot of companies can enter and exit the market. That's not happening in oligopoly. When they behave like monopolistic competition, they still have very high barriers to entry and they still only have a few firms, comparatively speaking. And so if in monopolistic competition, one of them wants to shut down or leave the market, they won't really shut down or leave the market. They'll probably just move over to the merger and get acquired. They call it an acquisition and get acquired by one of the other companies that's already in the industry. Okay. And so here's the, uh, this is just sort of a summary of uh, the d whether, depending on the market, in some of the oligopoly markets, the firms may behave more cooperatively with one another. And in some of them, they might behave more competitively with one another.